thanks everybody for coming. The last time I read in Ithaca, which wasn't that long ago, a friend of mine said to me later um, that he liked the reading because it was so funny. And that's, that's okay, because I do have humorous elements in my poems, but I thought, you know, I really don't want to be characterized as a funny poet. So tonight, I, I promise to, to plunge you into the depths of dystopian bleakness, uh, from which you may never emerge uh, again. Actually, I write a lot of what I call short prose, which is kind of a generic term for what a lot of people call prose poems, nanofiction, microfiction, short shorts, uh, mini fiction, whatever. But I find that each of those terms has its very ardent and, pa and passionate kind of you know, uh, supporters. So I want to avoid the politics of it, and I just call it short prose, which is probably an easier way to put it. That way I don't have to you know, argue with somebody as to whether it's a fiction, not nanofiction or prose poem. Yeah. <laughs> we should get into tweet poetry. That might be good. Um, I want to read something. This is about a, um, a very well-known um, American cultural icon, and you will know who it is. Um, and um, it's called The Sorrows of Young Mickey, not Mickey Mantle. Um, he appears trusting and outgoing, a pantomime of open-armed enthusiasm and modest chuckles masking his despair. Like Minnie, who also bears the curse and power of human language, he is incapable of communicating with other mice as they squeak and dart along the baseboards, driven by inscrutable purpose, ignoring him. At least he has many who will listen to him confess his fears in the vast dark house, its walls ticking and rasping with rodent commerce. He wonders at a universe that would strand them in nature as nothing else is stranded, inescapably exceptional, alien. They have love between them, yes, but a love born of siege and shared terror. He is whimpering in his sleep again, and Minnie, sighing awake as she does every night, takes his frail shoulders in her massive white-gloved hands, even in this moment, unable to truly touch him. For some reason I was struck by how terrifying Mickey and Minnie's big white-gloved hands are. Um, I'm, I'm going to read a few poems from A Civilization, the Das Madres book. And I have to tell you, this has been out for about three or four years. I don't think I've read more than one poem from this collection publicly. And the reason for that is that it's uh, the main, the bulk of it is one 35-poem sequence. And I know as soon as you say poetic sequence, at least half an audience gets terrified. But I'll try to, try to calm the fears a little bit by showing you that the poems are actually kind of small and minimal. Um, they're, they're very abstract. It's, it's a kind of a metaphysical meditation. It's, it's abstract. It's filled with contradictions. Um, all my poems are filled with contradictions and paradox. I think I'm, in, I'm naturally interested in that. But I thought tonight, since this is a Das Madres reading, that I would, I would read a few from it. So I'm going to read a few. Um, and these are all numbered sections. And only in a couple cases do the, do the numbers actually have some relevance to the content. Um, I'll just start with number nine. Again, the violent win against our learning, against our love, which, in honesty, has never been proven, only dreamt. But the dream guides our words, our hands, like an unseen mother's, warm on the wrist, admonishing, warning, giving from the selves we hid for shame. For shame of what? In the face of human savagery, love shrinks or grows massive. We never know. 10. Lost now and in need of reconstruction. This dark age, never more enlightened, falls prey to self-regard, its beauty recognized by torchlight, shouted to the night and held to blame. Awakening is whiplash to dream. Inspection is broom to mystery. Yet with all known, so much resists. Can it be worth itself? No pruning tames the vine, the bold momentum. More than ever, hope and blindness arc the known, describing next. 11. Nature ruins facades. With fume and acid, we collude. Our spirits wander lonely in their cars, cruising Stonehenge, breaking for cathedrals. Photographic proof teases pattern from belief and history. Tonight, 
The monks proceed head down along the highway, trick or treaters failing both. Hop in, we say. The world is more than being can stand. Moving makes it smaller. Here, within our hands, its circumference, turning as we will. Number 12. One nation in relief from continents. We're comfortable with this. A topographic fate, a history thrust above events. We say our destiny, so bloodshed only tints the tapestry, does not pool or ruin our day. Ragged parts of something smooth, projectile, protective. We citizens submit our past as evidence of movement more conscious, more conscious, more intent. Raw November sees us national in patriotic tears, caught between. 13. Burden is the price of memory. Bear trees gall because remembered in green or yellow splendor. So too with sons, once plump and loving, grown tall and dulled by music made industrial. In the church, eerie now to gull or pigeon, once coral in its promises. Memory walks hard behind, its shadow overarching mere prediction, downslope of the rainbow. On the bright street, someone's father opens his shop and, whistling, unfurls a green awning. Maybe one more here. Uh, keep, keep me on schedule here, Mary. So. <laughs> okay. um, number 20. The soul loses ground. Every day in offices from windows overlooking busy waterways and tightening streets, the soul raises its timid hand, its fingers smooth from too little work, its fine wrists so breakable, inviting violence, contempt. It says, ahem, or please, words meant to stop a deed it cannot lend itself to sanction. Its cracking voice is lost in the eyes and backslaps. It's what you went to school to please, and now it thinks it owns your life. You know less and less as time dims your past, and damn you're proud of this ignorance. The erosion of before, your presence itself unbecoming. There's a, uh, there are a few standalone poems in this book as well, and there's one um, that started out as a sequence, and it, it ended up being just three poems, um, an, an eclipse sequence. And they're poems that really have something to do with um, something coming in between whatever your subjective consciousness is and whatever's being observed or, or experienced. Um, so I'll just read, I think I'll just read two of those, and they're short. Eclipse one. When you entered, a shadow came between your face and my expectation of it. I blamed my treacherous eyes, the sizzling gooseneck lamp. I wanted you to see all one of me as you want me to see your face in my reflection. But it doesn't work that way. We are stuck with being happy or in love with half a world. Eclipse 3. Less a law than how things come to be, covertly and deliberately, and not at all as planned. In unraveling nations, people fight until their languages surrender. Ports fill with cargo ships, crates of electronics carried off in Toyota trucks. We've wired the world to see and hear itself as we believe it is, like surgeons we let our sterile hands probe the keyboard. We consult texts, text the transformations. But always, something falls between us and the words. A cold patience is demanded to see the courses being run, to read the cycles. A new world at its start seems yet another strange, familiar thing returning. Um. Since there are copies of it here, I thought I'd read just, just two, two poems from uh, an earlier book, uh, The Spectra, which uh, is very different from, from a civilization. The, the poems are all the same form. They're all 15-line poems composed of 13-syllable lines. And it's a form that kind of evolved. And some of you might remember uh, the late John Stallworthy, Professor Stallworthy, who was a poet and critic who taught at Cornell. And I had 
taken a poetics class with him, and I'd been writing formal poems at the time, traditional forms, and um, got interested in the idea of nonce forms, forms that, that hadn't existed before, but that you might create um, on your own. And, and the 13 syllable lines seemed to create a kind of rollicking, rolling sort of rhythm that I found appealing. They, were, they, were, they moved quickly. And the poems are associative and, and somewhat, somewhat quick in their imagery, very, very imagistic as opposed to the abstract poems in a civilization. So um, I think I'll just read maybe one of those. And because it's summer, it seemed like a good summer poem to read. Um, a Season or a Life in Kansas. Oh, and by the way, this, this makes a reference to uh, The Wizard of Oz, the film. And I hope some of you, some of you were able to see the crystal ball that, uh, from The Wizard of Oz that was on display up at uh, Croc Library. It was great. I watched the movie again a couple days later, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I, I almost could touch that. I saw that. A season or a life in Kansas. In mid-August, the sibilance of meadows stirs us. Though no snakes appear, no fire winds through the brittle weeds. And the heat is something stayed, established, less awkward than it was in May when everyone acclaimed its young arrival. Summer is a house we've lived in all our lives, which we are only just now hearing. The tick of heat ducts, banshee cries of water in the pipes, the settling sigh of stone foundation calls a truce with gravity. It's our house, and though we pledge we'll never move, how can we stop its moving? Like Dorothy on her way to Oz, spent spinning upward, but safe inside, watching the universe change through her bedroom window, too entranced to be afraid. And suddenly a fresh and coded world, not ours, exploding color as we've never seen, as we believe we'll never see again. And I'm going to end with, with two poems from a, 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 a book. Yeah, I'm going to say a book in progress. It's kind of been in progress for about 10 or 15 years. Um, so the poems themselves are not all that new, but they, they haven't appeared in nice covers like, like these yet. Um, this one I'm reading because it was prompted by, um, this has a line, uh, a line in it, um, you know, lost how, funny how lost causes return years later, robust despite amnesia. I, um, something from 37 years in my past came up last week that really kind of shocked and, shocked and surprised me in a pleasant kind of way. But um, in thinking of, of somehow unexpected corners of your past life suddenly appearing before you again as you're walking down the street. You know. um, and this is a, a, a case, so I, I thought I would read this. It's called Think Again. The more I try to focus, the farther things recede. Crocus, cathedral, stop sign. Sunlight leaches trees birch white, limbs ghosting into air. Then comes night, which is opposite to everything. Goodbye, goldfinch, sundial, mansard roof. What have I forgotten? What did I mean to forget? Oh yes, she once kissed me as if she meant it, and in sleep our bodies nestled as if cast from a single mold. Funny how lost causes return years later, robust despite amnesia, the frightening bruises. Rumors of happiness, though scuffed and scalded, never seem to peter out. They should require licenses for remembering. Lavender, erection, wedding dress. We love the first time in a vertigo of comprehension, and then the spinning stops. Yeah, yeah long time ago now. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll end with this one. It's called a, a Politics of Touch. It comes down to what you let me control. I want this much to do whatever I will do with it, which may or may not threaten what you want to do with the what you have. Trouble begins when our fingers touch. Too bad. In a different time or circumstance, I might love you as readily as you could me. Imagine our families together at the Ringling Circus, our kids sharing popcorn, gasping as a pair of sleek Europeans flies overhead, unfazed by physics, hardly real. How wonderful, we'd say, amid the oohs and ahs, when their hands meet in a saving grasp, one of them more grateful than the other. Thanks very much. Appreciate your attention.